Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We always start our programs right on time. My name is Grace Mary Brady. I'm the president and founder of the Bayside History Museum here in North Beach. Uh, with us today, we have Joni Kilman, who is standing in the back. We always partner ship with our Calvert Libraries for all of our lectures. In the past two months, we have partnership with the Calvert Marine Museum and are so fortunate to have one of their paleontologists with us today. A couple little housekeeping. Uh, please turn your cell phone off. The lecture will go approximately 45 minutes. There will be plenty of time afterwards for those of you who have bought fossil treasures to be identified. Mr. Nance has some uh, fossils up here that was actually found from this excavation in Chesapeake Beach. And if you have bought treasures that you have found from the beach, he is glad to identify anything that you bought today. So there will be plenty of time. Uh, I would like to introduce the mayor for the town of North Beach, Mayor Mark Frazier. Our town council member always wears two hats. I don't know what the Bayside History Museum would do without council member Mickey Hummel. He is technology supreme. He's back there with the video camera. Thank goodness we have it. That's all I can say. We have a couple um, Bayside History Museum staff here today. Tori, could you stand, please? Let's see who else is here. Okay, these are our two college students who've been with us. Vincent, two years. Tori, one year. Uh, Vincent's majoring in history, and Tori is going to the University of Baltimore majoring in biology. We're very lucky to have a lot of youth working at the Bayside History Museum. It keeps us on our toes. So without further ado, it is with great pleasure, and we really appreciate you coming out today. This is John Nance. We have two paleontologists at the Calvert Marine Museum. We have Dr. Stephen Godfrey, who talked last month about everything dinosaur. And then we have John Nance, who is the collections manager for all of the paleontology. He was in charge and worked with the Gibson family on the excavation of the shark. And we're just so excited to hear what he has to say today. We'll let these last couple people come in, come in, find the seat. And without further ado, John, thank you very much. John Nance. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick little plug for a talk that we're hosting at the Calvert Marine Museum next month on April 9th, and it's going to be presented by Dr. Robert Hazen. Um, if you've seen one of the recent NOVA episodes, he did um, the, the story of life's rocky start, which is the sort of origins of life from, um, from the rocks below our feet. And so he's going to come and give us a, a sort of a, another talk on that to, to expand on what was in the show. Um, and he's a great speaker. It, it'll be a, a really fun, fun talk if you're able to, to come down there and make it. All right, so I'm going to be talking about sharks in our backyard. So right below our feet, everybody here, we've got shark teeth underneath our feet. Um, yeah, there's just hundreds and thousands, probably millions of sharks teeth in Calvert County, and they're just, they're all over the place. And so we had the, the fortune of getting a phone call back in uh, 2014 in October on Halloween about a shark skeleton that was found in somebody's backyard. And it was a very strange call. It's not something you expect to get, but it was detailed enough that uh, we knew that it, it was something important. Um, and so we, we went out there and and checked it out. Um, and so this was a picture taken just at the, the beginning of it. They had, they had sort of uncovered some stuff, and this is when we first saw it, and we were sort of going crazy. Uh, Stephen and I were sort of, we didn't know what to do with ourselves. Uh, it was so, so exciting. Um, so I'm going to give uh, a quick review of the geology of Calvert Cliffs. Um, specifically focusing on the region around Chesapeake Beach. 
I'm uh, going to talk about some of the, the primary sharks that we find along Calvert Cliffs, um, show you some of the, the shark's teeth from our collection, and that will be in the, the upcoming book. Um, talk a little bit about preservation and shark fossils, and then the rest of the talk will be devoted to the, the excavation and the, um, the dig at the, the Gibson's property. <coughs> All right, so this is just a really cool picture. Um, if any of you have seen the, the book that we have down at the Marine Museum on <coughs> fossils of Calvert Cliffs, there's a really cool image of this lady walking through the, the water at Chesapeake Beach or at, at Brownings Beach. And this is another image from that series uh, where some Smithsonian scientists back in 1908 are walking along Calvert Cliffs collecting fossils. And some of their field notes were just crazy. The, they, they would talk about finding so much stuff that they would just leave piles of things on the trees or, or on the, the side of the cliff because they couldn't carry everything. All right, so this is a uh, stratigraphic column of Calvert Cliffs. So the way you look at this is from bottom to top. The oldest sediments are at the bottom, youngest are at the top. And so we've got sediments that are ranging from about 10 to 20 million years old along Calvert Cliffs. And especially around here, the sediments range from about 16 to 18 million years old. Um, so it's a 2 million year range, but it's um, yeah, pretty constrained. And so I've done a blow up of just this small section, and this is the these are the layers that are exposed along along Chesapeake Beach, covers uh, Cliffs, Bayfront Park, that area. Um, so the classic layers that people think about, or well, here are people talk about bed 3B or bed 4 or zone 4, and these these all refer to oh, thank you. Um, so these all refer to the original layer uh, that was given by uh, the layer name given by Shattuck back in 1904. And so we still follow a lot of that. Um, things have changed a little bit, but they're largely consistent. And so anybody that's walked down at the beach down there at the Brownies Beach, uh, you'll see that big oyster bed right at the base. That's the, the line between the 3B and Shattuck 4 uh, layers. And that's the, the start of the, the Calvert formation from the or the, uh, the Fairhaven member to the Plum Point model member. And then the most fossiliferous layers are, are these ones here, and especially Zone 10. And most likely Zone 10 is where the, the Gibson family snaggletooth shark came from. And I'll get into a little bit of that uh, later on. Um, so, next slide. So this is another picture of the, the cliffs, and anybody that's been down there recognizes that, that curve that you always have to walk around to, to get to the good stuff. Um, and that's how they, they dressed to go collecting back in the early 1900s. So along Calvert Cliffs, you've got uh, a number of layers. I mentioned oldest is as at the bottom, youngest is at the top. And along Calvert Cliffs, the, the beds aren't completely flat. So it's, it's not just a layer cake. They're actually tilted a little bit. And so they tilt at roughly uh, 11 feet per mile. And so at the very north end of the county where we are here, you get the oldest sediments. And at the south end of the county, you get the youngest sediments. And so using that, that information, I was able to trace the elevation of the, where the Snaggletooth shark was found to the layers there at Chesapeake Beach, Brownies Beach, to figure out that it was at that zone 10 area. Um, and then we also recently had some microfossil analyses done to corroborate that. So they weren't able to pin it down exactly to that, um, that layer, but they said they, they were able to say that it's definitely from this layer and the ones below it. So the, the four through nine and, and, and zone 10. So 
more than likely based on the, the sediment that was there, the fossils, the preservation, most likely sort of the, the lower part of Bent 10. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk about the sharks of the Chesapeake Bay region and all of the fossils that, that we really like to find. Um, so right now, there are 53 known species of cartilaginous fish. So shark, sharks, rays, chimeras, which are the rat fish, are uh, all cartilaginous fish. So they have a cartilage skeleton, and uh, they have the hard enamel teeth. Um, so there's three species of rat fish, 38 species of sharks, and 12 species of skates and rays. And this is the current count based on uh, a book that's going to be coming out hopefully soon. Um, as far as the, the modern mid-Atlantic region goes, uh, we've only got 46 species of uh, sharks and rays. We don't have any ratfish in the mid-Atlantic region any longer. Um, and it's split about two-thirds are sharks and one-third is are, are rays. Um, so I'm just going to go through the next few slides on, on some of the, the teeth that uh, that we typically find along Calvert Cliffs and just some of the, the really cool really cool fossils. Uh, so this is Procaracles megalodon, which is the, the big giant white shark. Uh, on the right here are the, the classic megalodon teeth. On the left here are teeth that are given the name Chubutensis. And so that's a slightly older shark, and that's more typical of what you would find uh, up here at uh, Chesapeake Beach. And the, the thing that lets you know, that lets you distinguish those species is this little cusp right here. So they, they largely look the same, but that cusp lets you know that it's one of the, the older species. There's still a little bit of uncertainty about that um, because there are associated sets of shark's teeth that have some with cusp, some with out. So where do you draw the line? Uh, but that's, a, that's sort of the, the general uh, trend right now. Um, and so again, we have uh, some of the Makos, or, uh, and then some of the, the, I don't know what they are. They're not considered Makos anymore. They're sort of relatives of the Great White, or precursors to the Great White, or some other family that, um, that they belong to. But these are the ones that people think of. When you say a mako tooth, you found a mako tooth along Calvert Cliffs. This is what you think of. And that's the Nesima Stalins. That's the classic broad, broad shaped tooth. And then the, the teeth that are definitely mako, um, but are maybe a little less common, are the Isurus oxyrhynchus and Isurus retroflexus. So these are oxyrhynchus here. These are retroflexus. And then this is a, a small vertebra from one of these sharks. Uh, the really telling thing about these vertebrae are these little lines right here. So the, these sharks are in the, a larger family, along with Megalodon, in a family called Laminidae. And so it's named for the laminations of these vertebrae. Um, so anytime you find a vertebra with all these little lines in it, you can tell that it's from that family. If it's really big, you can say pretty certainly if it's found around here, it's Megalodon. If it's smaller, yeah, then it's a little iffy. Um, and then, so we've got some of the, the more obscure teeth that collectors like me love to find these ones, but they're so few and far between. Um, so you get some of the Alopius teeth, which are the, the thresher sharks, and then Alopius grandis is the, the giant thresher. Um, You've got, and that actually comes in a non-serrated and a serrated form, and there's some paleontologists trying to work all of that out right now. Uh, and then one of the even rarer teeth is the paratodus um, tooth, which is just a really big, bulky, sort of bulbous tooth. Uh, it's from a, a shark that would have inhabited much deeper waters, so that's why it's not as common uh, around Calvert Cliffs, where we had some deep water, but in the big scheme of things, it wasn't that deep. Um, and so the, the focus of most of this talk after after this is going to be on the snaggletooth shark. 
And this is the, the classic snaggletooth shark. So you've got these vertebrae here, and the, the side view, you can see it doesn't have those laminations anymore, but it has these little holes. And these are where the processes from the vertebrae, uh, or the sort of the spines on the vertebrae, would be fit, would fit into those vertebrae. And one of the characteristic things about their vertebrae are all of these little dots here. They're sort of haphazardly placed. Those are uh, very indicative of the, the snaggle tooth shark and hemichristus. Um, again, with the, the teeth, you have both upper teeth and lower teeth. So the upper teeth are these ones here that have uh, the very coarse serrations on the side. And then the lower teeth have uh, very smooth edges. So a way to think about this is the upper teeth with the very coarse serrations are sort of like a steak knife. The lower teeth are very smooth. They're kind of like a fork. So they're able to sort of latch on to whatever prey they have and then just sort of move their, their, the top part of their jaw back and forth to just slice through whatever the prey is. Uh, so it's a really cool shark, and you wouldn't think a lot of times finding these two different teeth that are from the same shark. And so we were able to figure that out from a modern species. We have one of those over here, if you want to look at it after the talk. Um, but finding the, the shark in the, the Gibson's backyard, that sort of you know, really sort of made it obvious that these two different teeth, tooth types are absolutely from the same shark. They're absolutely from the top and the bottom of the jaws. Um, the preservation was just so good that we, we could see all of that in that specimen. Um, and then so some more really cool fossils that we also find around here. So I mentioned the rays. So you get the big myliobatus, the big eagle rays. Um, you get the adobatus here. And these are just single pieces of some of the other types of rays. Um, you get every once in a while you'll find a piece of their, their tail spine. Um, so that that very coarsely serrated looks sort of like a um, a needle almost. Um, and that's that's a really really cool thing. To think about. <coughs> this thing here is is very odd and we're not exactly sure what it is, but it's been suggested that it's the um, sort of the, the fossilized sac that the venom or the, the, the poison venom was in the, in the skates or, or in, the, in the big rays. So these were uh, attributed to, to manta rays, um, mainly because of the large size. It would be really cool to have it x-rayed or CT scanned to see what it looks like on the inside. But if it's just some sort of weird bone or if it's really some sort of organ like that. Uh, and then these are the teeth that almost everybody finds. If you go down to Brownies Beach, these are the teeth that you're going to find. And I think we even found some in the, uh, the snaggletooth shark when we were working on that. So these are the gray sharks. And the gray sharks make up a very large family of sharks. And so there's many different species. They're, they're the ones with the most species of sharks uh, in that family. And many of the teeth are very difficult to, to tell apart from one another without a very large sample size and a lot of experience of working with them. Uh, it's not even something I really confidently can do. And then, so I mentioned some of the, the rat fish as well. So these are pieces of rat fish mouth plates. They sort of look like in, you know, ambiguous uh, bone pieces, but these white parts right here are very distinctive for the rat fish. And then, of course, the, the cow shark. Everybody loves to find the cow sharks. So this is just a single tooth. So it looks like many, many little teeth. And one tooth. So they would have hundreds of these in their mouth. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the preservation of shark fossils. So shark, sharks are typically, well, sharks are always cartilaginous fish. So I mentioned that at the beginning of the talk. 
So their, their whole skeleton is made out of cartilage from their jaws, their ears, every, every part of their, their body where you would think it might be bone like we have, it's all cartilage. <coughs> um, and so that's why it's, it's very rare to find any sort of fossilized shark bones. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, that's, it's, it's really rare to find it. We've got, these are just a, a couple examples that we have in the museum where we have uh, a number of tiger shark teeth that are embedded in some preserved cartilage. This is uh, a small piece of cartilage, which is the very characteristic texture and shape. Um, there's little sort of what are called tesserae. These little hex hexagons are what make up all the cartilage. So it's all these little calcified crystalline structures, and they, they're all linked together by uh, fibers and tissue. So when a shark dies, that stuff typically just sort of blows apart, especially in a marine environment. Um, if it doesn't get buried quickly, it's just going to fall apart. And so the most common thing that we find from shark skeletons, aside from their teeth, are vertebrae. And that's typically because even though they're cartilage, they're a bit denser, and they're not made out of the same, the same tesserae. And so that's why they probably preserve a little bit better. And so in, uh, in our collection, we've also got a number of associated specimens. So again, that's something else that's exceedingly rare. These are the only association, <coughs> associated fossils that we have in our collection. So we have another small set of tiger shark teeth in cartilage, and then this associated set of mako shark's teeth. Um, and that's all we have. So in a marine environment, you're never going to find something, um, or not never, but it's rare to find things fully articulated and sort of in a lifelike position. So whenever something dies in the ocean, it gets scattered about, scavenged, and, and so to get something preserved so well is just exceedingly rare. And to get something preserved together, all, all the pieces together is exceedingly rare. So just finding these 27 or so teeth um, is, was you know, a really cool find. They were actually found by two different people, but they knew that they had both found it at the same spot. All right, and so this is the, the best thing that everybody came for today. So I'm gonna talk about the, the snaggletooth shark skeleton that was found um, in the backyard of the Gibson family just a, just a couple years ago. So they were building an addition onto their house and um, you know, build it and we're setting footers or digging out footers for the for the addition. They took all of that dirt that had come up from the footers, set it to the side, and didn't think anything else about it. And till it rained the one night, they went out there and found some of the vertebrae. So you see these weird little discs just sitting sitting in this pile of dirt, and they wondered, okay, there's some something weird is was going on here that you don't typically see that. And they started to, to look a little bit further. Um, they kept finding more vertebrae, and we've got some of the vertebrae teeth over here. And, yep, and so we've got a couple celebrities in the room here. <laughs> so I think one day, they, as they were continuing to, to dig here and, and find more fossils, they got to, to play hooky from school to, to help their dad <coughs> dig up some of the fossils. And so this is him, uh, Caleb, holding one of the, the vertebrae that they found. And somebody's down in the, in the hole digging. <clears throat> so this is uh, one of the trays of vertebrae that they had <coughs> when, we, uh, when we went there to see the specimen. So they, they had a lot, all of these laid out, and um, you know, it, was just, it was just crazy. And, um, so it was just really, really exciting to see all of that. And so this is more, more of them. So this was, this was in their garage that, that we saw. Um, sort of after, after we saw the first set of teeth in the ground, and they're like, oh, we found this other stuff, and, and this was the other stuff that they had found as well. So we knew that there was a lot of this animal present. 
Um, so we, we go around, when we first get there, we go around the house and sort of just walk into the backyard and there's uh, they're standing around. And I, I look down into the hole and just sort of, yeah, I'm at a loss for words. I don't know what to say. It's something that, you know, we never, you just, you never see it. And so, you know, we get down there, we start looking at it closer. They had uncovered, uh, along with their, uh, their friend Pat and um, the, the rest of the family, they had uncovered uh, a number of the teeth and a string of about 30 vertebrae, which extend beyond here. And so all of these teeth here, these are all lower teeth, which are the more needle-like, more fork-like ones. And you can see them, they're just stacked one on top of the other. And so going around and seeing this, it was just, it was just crazy. Um, and so, and then we also have the upper teeth. So we knew that we had an entire jaw. Almost the entire jaw of this shark was preserved. And then all of this purple coloring or all, all around here is actually the cartilage. So when you look really closely, you can see those tesseract. And so it was just, it was just amazing what was there. And so this is us again, right after we, we first came around there and started looking at it. Um, and you know, we're, we're getting excited. We're you know, trying to figure out, okay, how, you know, what are we gonna do here? What's gonna, what's gonna happen? Um, and Stephen and I actually had another appointment down at Cove Point to go and quarry another fossil that day. And so we had to run off and do that and then run back on Halloween evening, um, back up to the Gibson's house. We gathered all of our gear, got everything together, um, and, and just started, started working away and, and started digging around. And it, you know, it, was a, it was a family affair. Everybody was involved. It was, it was great. Um, so here's Stephen and uh, one of the Gibson family in the hole digging along and this is the, the shark here and so we're working on trying to remove the dirt from around the shark so that we can put it in, a, in our field jacket. So we were working well into the night luckily because they were building this addition on their house they had some nice big spotlights uh, handy and they brought those out so we were working in the dark with these nice spotlights as we're trying to, to put the jacket on the um, on the specimen, and there's Stephen drinking some coffee, just kind of just kind of standing around like oh. <laughs> he just showed up over here, so that's why I'm giving him a hard time. <laughs> and so we've uh, this is us just just about getting getting ready to remove the jacket from the ground. So we finalized the, the jacket. We put some rebar in there again. From, from the family, they just had everything there for us. It was, it was the easiest dig that we've ever done, really. Even though it was, it was very rare, it was just, it was a great experience. Um, and so even though it looks over here like this might be gone, that's just the, the light from those, those big spotlights and that stuff. And so, you know, we're working on this in the dark. We finish up probably about nine o'clock. Remember, this is still Halloween. So we're hauling this thing out. We sort of strapped it to a piece of plywood and we're hauling it out of the backyard in the middle of the dark. We've got this, it looks like a mummy. We're walking down the street. You hear people in the background with chainsaws, you know, and kids are running up and down the street with you know, all of their costumes. And I'm pretty sure we got some nice candy out of the deal too. Uh, so it was, it was a really surreal experience. Um, you know, walking out of there at, in the middle of the night on Halloween with this thing. It was just, it was just crazy. Um, so once we got it back to the museum, we wanted to begin preparing it. But before we started preparing it, before just jumping right into the jacket and digging away, we wanted to get an idea of what's in there. You know, we, we saw a good, good picture of what was in there. Um, from what they had prepared when we went out into the field. Um, but we wanted to have a, an even clearer picture. And so we took it up to Johns Hopkins and wrapped it up, uh, still like a mummy, it's still completely covered. 
and we took it through this uh, this huge uh, CT scanner, and it's really a, a, an amazing thing if you've never had one done. Um, there's just a giant magnet that's running through here at, at very high speeds, and it's using that to, to image everything that's, that's inside of this jacket. And so this is what we were able to see uh, inside of that jacket. That was done just on their computers as they were um, sort of processing the, the images. And so these are all the vertebrae that are lined up and this is the sort of halo of teeth that are in there. So again, the lower teeth here are all sort of jumbled in, in this one section, which is what you would expect. And then the upper teeth are, are out here on the outside. And so again, and this was just a, a great thing to see, but it's also a really good tool. So now I know what I'm looking at, what I'm gonna run into when I start preparing this thing so I don't accidentally go through a bunch of cartilage or, or something like that. If this, this was such a significant find, we wanted to you know, make sure that we were, we were working on it properly. And um, so these were, these were great images to have. And so these were a couple of the, the images that we took. And these are the, the slices through the CT scans. And so again, you can see this, this halo of teeth, all of these the lower teeth here and the upper teeth here and it's just that that whole the whole jaw is there and then all of, all of these sort of bright spots on these images where it's not a tooth that's actually cartilage so because of the density of the cartilage it is is more it's it's a little bit denser than the surrounding dirt we are able to distinguish the cartilage from the dirt and from the other uh, other things in this jacket. And so that allowed us to sort of go through slice by slice, pick out the, the best slices and uh, use that to prepare the specimen. So whenever I was digging into any area, I knew exactly what I was, what, what to expect as I was removing the dirt. And so that, that was just a, a huge, a huge asset to us. And so this is the, the final product. So this is the what it all looked like after it was all prepared. So the picture's kind of dark here, um, but these are a lot of the teeth here, a lot of teeth here, and anywhere that it's dark, that's all cartilage. So the light color is still sediment or sand, but all of this is cartilage. So that's cartilage. That's all cartilage around the teeth, and this is all cartilage here. So it's, there's a good bit of the, the jaws there, which is really amazing. Uh, and so this is what it looks like now uh, on display down at our museum. And so that's the that's the talk. Do you have any questions? Yeah, so the, the thing that we removed was about three feet long and about 18 inches wide. And so that, that was just the head and part of the, the vertebral column. The whole shark would have been around 12 to 15 feet long. You have a question? I don't know. That's a good question. They're from sharks are even older than the dinosaurs, so there were sharks around <coughs> hundreds of millions of years ago. How many inches below ground level was the find? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I wish I had some, some better pictures of it. Uh, it was a, around a foot deep. Um, and so in the in the jacket as I was preparing it, there were still grass roots coming up through this jacket. And so I would, I would work on it for a while, go home, come back the next day, and the roots, it was like they were still growing. They were, they were getting taller. Um, and also, there were ants burrowing all through this, this jacket. So whenever I was going through there, I'd run into these little, little ant burrows or ant 
um, ant trails, and so I ended up, they were you know, burrowing so much, I had to end up getting little ant traps to, to get rid of them. Um, it's nothing I've ever experienced, you just don't expect to, to see that. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it was just below the surface, and so they, uh, when the houses were built, there was probably all kinds of stuff, it was just, just by chance that this was laying underneath their, the, their grass in their backyard for you know, over a decade, I think, before it was found. Yeah. What are the teeth made out of? The teeth are made out of enamel and dentine, so they're very similar to, to our teeth. So you've got that enamel outside, which is the, the really shiny sort of hard part. And then if you ever get a cavity and you, you feel that, that pain there, that's the dentine that, that the enamel, part of the enamel has, has sort of worn away. And that dentine is being exposed along with the root. Um, so that's, one, that's why they're so well preserved, or, or shark's teeth are, are so common, is because of that, that enamel that's so tough. Do you have another question? What do hammerhead sharks, do hammerhead sharks attack people? Probably, but I don't know. <laughs> shark attacks are fairly rare, so it's usually bigger sharks. Hammerheads have actually have pretty small ones. Are tribal teeth sharks common in this area? Uh, fossils, yes. Yeah, so, um, they're sort of, they, they hit their peak during the middle Miocene, so they're even more common as you move further south, closer to the state park or flag ponds. That's where you get just tons and tons of them. Um, but as far as fossils go, they're, they are fairly common. Um, the living species is only over in the Indo-Pacific. So the, the fossil species was uh, a global species. It, it's been found here, it's been found in California, it's been found in South America, uh, I believe in Europe as well. Um, and so, but yeah, the, the fossils are, you know. Another question here? Why do shark teeth um, come in white and black? So, shark's teeth, that's a very good question. So the shark's teeth, when they're white, that's when it come, has come right out of the, the shark's mouth. So, all shark's teeth start out white when the animal is alive. And so they look just like our teeth, you know, they're nice and shiny and white. And then when they become fossils, they pick up some of the minerals and, and other materials from the sediment or the, the matrix that, that is surrounding it. And that's how they get that color. So sometimes you'll get some that are sort of brown, sometimes you'll get some that are really black. You get all, all different kinds of colors, but it's from that fossilization process. What is the likelihood the rest of us might have a shark in our backyard? <laughs> Probably pretty good. I think everybody here should should go ahead and get a shark in your backyard. If you find something, give, give us a call. Hi, I was wondering um, what would, as a name, what would be the largest? Um, not that it's short, that it's I, I know when I search for them, I'm for them, you know, I don't find them really, you know, in the finding large, maybe three quarters of an inch, two an inch, maybe? Yeah. Where they get, what's the largest that you will get? Um, they can get up to two inches. Okay. And so you usually find those, uh, they're more common down in Florida or North Carolina, um, sort of some, some of the younger sediments where they do get very large. Um, around here, one and a half inches is pretty close to the maximum size, and uh, some of the, the teeth that were found with the shark are, are near that sort of maximum size for this area. Is that what's the upper animal? Yeah, generally they're, they're pretty similar. The, the largest teeth in the mouth are, are about the same size. Mm -hmm. Gibson's backyard, how far away from the current bay? Um, so it's a few hundred feet, or actually many hundreds of feet away from the bay, and the elevation is about 50, 54 feet. Actually, I think it's about a mile away from the bay, so, uh, yeah, I, well, um, probably, probably more like a quarter of a mile. Okay, all right. Yeah, I can't, I couldn't remember exactly. It was, it was a mile from 
where where your house is to the to Brownies Beach when I was trying to figure out that that sediment uh, you know, the, the layers that were there. So yeah, thank you. Uh, could a, a the size of a skeleton change when it gets fossilized? Uh, it's not going to change too much when it fossilizes. So sometimes they can take on a little extra mineral, but they're and to where you get uh, they can take on extra stuff, but it's going to be noticeable. It's going to look like it has a crust or something on it. Um, typically, at least especially along Calvert Cliffs, um, basically what you see is is what it looked like in in real life. The vertebrae with the shark, uh, with the Gibson shark, are much bigger than the typical vertebrae that I found with other sharks. Is that, does that have more to do with the conditions that preserve that shark? Um, so I think part of it is the species of shark, and um, just that, that this was a, a fairly large shark. So even though you know, we, we typically find vertebrae that are you know, maybe one inch, give or take. That's that's sort of a typical size. Um, you know, the, and that's those are from generally the gray sharks, which are a little bit smaller than the snaggle tooth, and and so that's um, that's why you tend to find a lot of them that size because that's that, those were the most prolific sharks during the Miocene. Um, yeah, so the the large ver vertebra size from this shark is indicative of the species and, and that it was just a very large individual. Do we know why there's such a large deposit of shark's teeth just in this one area? So that's a, that's a good question. So all of this area used to be underwater uh, during the Miocene. All of it was anywhere from uh, beachfront property here. So it, it could have been like right around where what the water levels are today all the way up to 200 to 300 feet uh, above us would be the, the surface of the water. So when, when, this, when all of the, the fossils were deposited along Cover Cliffs, the water was much, much deeper, and at times it extended almost to where Washington, D.C. is. So it was, it was a, a very temperate, um, sort of tropical inland, not inland sea, but a, a shallow sea that's very conducive to great biodiversity of, of sharks and, and other, other animals. There's all kinds of different uh, animals that are found along covered cliffs. And so that, that's the reason that there were so many sharks. And because of having that many sharks, that's why you end up getting so many shark fossils in this area. I believe you said that it was uh, 10 to 18 million, million years ago yeah. for the Miocene. And in that period, where would you put this guy? Uh, this guy is right around 16 million years old. So now, would that be with the crocodile teeth that you can find down here? It, are those, would you say that those are a bit older? Uh, the crocodile teeth that you find along Calvert Cliffs, they could be that age. They, you can find them pretty much in all of the layers that are that are present at Calvert Cliffs, so they they range, um, you know, that, that whole range. But you can, you know, you'll find them where they're 18, where they're 16, uh, you know, down to 10 million years old. Hi, I was wondering, um, you were talking about my readings that I do on, on the sharks in this area here, and it was a warm, shallow area. Would that be what I was to understand more like around the sea, the sea lines, you know, was it that a low, was that a calving ground, calving, or where they were uh, breeding ground for the sharks that were coming in um, and, um, and be there? So um, it's possible. Uh, we do have smaller megalodon sharks. Uh, teeth, but you also get some of the big ones. So it could have been an area like that where where it was, um, you know, a good. It was a, it was clearly a good place for all animals to live, um, and so that because there was just so many different types of animals, you have everything from sea turtles to manatees to crocodiles, and um, you know, and then the sharks and the whales. So 
But I don't know if there's any evidence to say that it was definitely like a calving area. Which path do you take to Calvert So at the Calvert Cliff State Park, the best one is to take the red trail. That'll take you right down to the beach. And if you contact them, sometimes you can get permission to, to walk further. But uh, you have to ask for special permission to do that. Because they, uh, they have all of the cliffs off limits because of the potential of them keeping them. What's older, the Gibson shark or the Astrodon? Astrodon is much older. Okay. So any of the dinosaurs are much older. So the their shark is from the Miocene epoch. And the, I don't know exactly. I think it's Cretaceous for the Astrodon. Um, and so that's you know, anywhere from 65 to uh, you know, I think it, it's around 100 million years old is where a lot of that stuff is, the age of that, that material. Debbie? What are the chances either more of that shark or associated sharks are near that location in that same yard? And has the landowner considered any further excavation? <laughs> <laughs> So, so after we were done, they did dig around some more and, and did find some more vertebrae, uh, most likely from the shark. Um, but there, there wasn't any evidence of sort of like a massive bone bed. So it, it was, uh, it's sort of interesting that, that this thing was preserved in the way that it was. Uh, one of our geologist friends thought that maybe it was from a storm deposit, at, and that's why it, it happened to get buried so quickly and preserved so well and it sort of you know without anything else sort of around it. And then maybe a megalodon jaw is just twenty feet away. It, it very well could be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the uh, yeah, the Requiem sharks, the gray sharks, they're all they're all part of the Carcharhinidae family, the Carcharhina sharks. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's just one, another one of the, the common names. Yeah. What are all the other species of sharks you have? Uh, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. Uh, I know there were, I'm pretty sure there were some gray sharks in there. Um, I want to say that there was a sand tiger. Uh, but I can't remember the other ones that were there off the top of my head. But there, there was, you know, there was a pretty good bit right in that little, little area. All right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, if you want to come and see some of the teeth and the vertebrae that were found there, uh, we've got them up here along with some modern shark jaws uh, from a, a modern snaggletooth shark. And um, if you have stuff that you'd like to have identified. I'd be happy to do that as well.